Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. It's probably one of the, well, I don't know, least under, well understood, but certainly misunderstood passages of Scripture. And what does Jesus mean by taking up your cross and follow, following him? And maybe we can learn something of this if we first consider what Jesus himself did and also the account of, well, Peter's unfortunate words to which Jesus received, uh, gave Peter a great rebuke. It began our gospel text today this way. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. Now, normally, Jerusalem is the place you go up to on uh, feast days and in times of need, in times of need of forgiveness, to offer the sacrifices that God had appointed and to receive the proclamation of forgiveness of sins, that promise attached to those sacrifices. You would go up on the various feast days with the appointed sacrifice and God would forgive you. So it was to go to Jerusalem was to go and receive the gifts of promise. No different than you going up, well, to Sherman Center to have your sins forgiven, attached to the promises of your baptism, the word of absolution, and the supper. But when Jesus says, and he begins to show them that he must go to Jerusalem, he doesn't have that in mind. Jerusalem is for Jesus the place where the prophets are killed. Berechiah, the son of, or Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, was sacrificed before the altar. Jeremiah was thrown into the pit, ultimately lost his life in Jerusalem too. Jesus is going to Jerusalem not to have the accusation of the law of his sins forgiven as we would, but rather to have that law applied to him to suffer in Jerusalem. Of course, what is the meaning of suffering? And that's part of the problem with bearing one's cross is that we don't really understand what suffering is either. Usually in the church we make light of the real sufferings that we experience. Somebody says that they um, have been diagnosed with cancer or they need surgery and we say, we'll pray for you. Now, we, I'm not saying we don't mean it, but we can't really suffer with them. They will suffer for sure. Physical ailment or loss of job or uh, of livelihood, or of a home, or some other kind of loss, that is ultimately suffering as well. But is that what Jesus means by bearing one's cross, to suffer the loss of things? I don't think so. So in the church, we had to come up, well, with an answer. What does it mean to take up one's cross? What does it mean to suffer? And usually it's talked about in the church as a whole list of spiritual disciplines, most of these being self-denial. We hear about these especially during the season of Lent, right? What are you giving up for Lent? And broadly speaking, the self-denial and the suffering that results are the things of the flesh. Uh, maybe three broad categories, food, sex, and sleep. And so especially amongst the monks in days of old and even now amongst pious Christians. We suffer during these penitential seasons with fasting, abstinence from food, abstinence from sex, and praying at all hours and even in the middle of the night. But I don't think that's what Jesus means by suffering or taking up one's cross, these self-imposed disciplines. Not that there's anything particularly wrong with them to discipline one's body. Paul talks about that as if running a race. But to take up your cross and follow me does not mean that you get to invent or manufacture your kind of suffering in order to fulfill Jesus' command here to take up a cross. Again, we can understand what Jesus is talking about if we look to see what it means for him to take up his cross. So when Jesus speaks of suffering, he's not talking about abstaining from the desires of the flesh. If anyone taught that, it was his forerunner, John the Baptist. 
who himself didn't cut his hair and ate a diet of locusts and wild honey and wore uncomfortable clothing. On the other hand, Jesus doesn't seem to abstain from these things at all. He's eating and drinking all the time, it seems. He's even accused of being a glutton and a wine bibber, as they used to say. Suffering for Jesus means this. Jesus links his suffering to the suffering servant songs of Isaiah, specifically Isaiah, the end of chapter 52, and especially chapter 53. Those words that we hear every Good Friday, and we learn exactly what it means to take up one's cross. The suffering servant Jesus takes on, as he goes into Jerusalem, the iniquity of us all. To suffer, to bear one's cross, is to bear the sins of the world. That's what it meant for Jesus. But you'll note that in the gospel text today, neither Peter, and ultimately not Satan either, wants a Messiah who takes on the sins of the world, dies the death they deserve, and then forgives it. Neither Peter nor Satan wants a Messiah who forgives sins. That's a scandal and a stumbling block. Rather, they would rather have a sort of Messiah that tells you what to do and says, follow me, do all the things I tell you to. A law Messiah. Peter keeps tripping over this because the suffering servant doesn't die for Israel alone, which would be what the law would demand. But instead, Jesus has repeatedly shown in his ministry, those who he has cared for and spoken to, that his Messiahship is for Jew and Gentile, indeed for the sins of the whole world. And Jesus reveals that was always the will of God, Jew first and then Gentile, to suffer the sins of the people, to die their death, and to forgive them that they would have life and life everlasting. That was always the will of God, and Isaiah chapter 53, go read it, written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, confesses it. Luther even says that that's the gospel, the gospel written by the fifth evangelist, the prophet Isaiah. That's because well, the scriptures are clear. The law cannot save and it cannot redeem. But Israel and Peter, and ultimately Satan, thought it could. Peter doesn't ever really seem to get over this. Even after Jesus' ascension, you'll remember it's still a point of contention uh, with Paul at the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. But when Jesus is resurrected, you'll note that he's resurrected without the law without sins, without death. Yours and everyone's sins, therefore, are forgiven. It's really impossible to believe, and Peter can't believe that, at least not yet. The Messiah does come to do the law, but ultimately to fulfill it once and for all. So Jesus, or so Peter then rebukes Jesus and actually tells him, forbids him, from being the suffering servant, the suffering Messiah of Isaiah 53. And that's what the law always does. It rebukes, it corrects, it disciplines, it condemns. But here, Peter has the audacity to turn Jesus' own law against himself. And who else twists God's word and tries to use it against God? Satan, the deceiver, dared to do so with Jesus in the wilderness temptations. And that's why Jesus then uses the binding key against Peter and Satan. That rebuke from Peter is not from the Holy Spirit, but rather from the evil spirit. Just in the few verses before our gospel text, Peter was an instrument of the Holy Spirit and confessed Christ to be the son of the living God. And Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church, that confession of faith. And now, just a few moments later, Peter becomes an instrument of the devil and rebukes the Lord from doing his Messiah job. What's interesting, then, is to note how Peter really can't do anything about what he has said because neither word actually came from him. First, he spoke by the Holy Spirit, 
And then he speaks by a demonic spirit. Get behind me, Satan. But you'll note that Jesus can tell the difference. When he hears the voice of Satan, he binds it. Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And there's a lesson here for us before we consider our crosses, that when we encounter these sorts of demonic words that would, well, lie to you about who Jesus is and what he has done for you, or where he's promised to be for you, for your faith, life, and salvation, that to fight against them, like Peter maybe tried to do, is, well, it's to fail. We cannot fight against demonic words ourselves. Instead, we commend them to God, as the prophet Jeremiah said. I'll quote it here for you. O oh Lord, you know, remember me and visit me, and take you, take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your enduring patience, do not take me away. Know that for your sake I have suffered rebuke. The only tool that we have, if we are to be God's instrument and not an instrument of the demonic spirit, is the Word of God. To know that Word, to have it written upon our hearts, to consider it as we go about our work, to meditate upon it day, morning, noon, and night. And that Word does not come from inside of us, but it, indeed it comes from outside of us, or in, as we used to say in Latin, extra nos. The word comes from outside of us, just as it did for Peter, whichever word we speak. But we pray that the word that we'd receive would be Jesus' word. And that gift the Spirit would use then to rebuke all the false words in our own hearts, the false words spoken by our neighbors, the false words of this world that seek to lead us astray. We are given just like Jesus did to bind the evil foe, to use that binding key to accuse, rebuke, and curse lies and liars. But that's not the final word. And if that was the only word we'd say, then we would never take up our cross and follow Jesus. After the rebuke and the repentance worked by the Spirit through that condemning word, Jesus will loose Peter ultimately by forgiving him, not just once, not twice, but three times. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. So again, we can learn what it means to take up our cross by considering Jesus, who actually suffered, yes, in his body, yes, he suffered death, but those were actually a result of his speaking the truth in love speaking it to Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees, speaking it to civil rulers like Pontius Pilate, speaking it to those who would like it or like it not, as the hymn says. That's what it means to take up one's cross, is to suffer for the sake of the truth that is Jesus, for speaking the truth that is the stumbling block and the rock of offense, to speak the word that offended Peter and Satan ultimately, which was this word, that it was necessary that Jesus suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, be killed and be raised the third day. That there is no salvation in anyone or anything other than Jesus. And not just any Jesus, but Jesus who suffered and died for your sins and rose again for your justification. That is an offense to those who would seek to save themselves, like Peter, or to have a different sort of salvation that comes by the doing of commands and rules. Instead, we are called to proclaim the good news of forgiveness, free and unrestrained in Jesus, which offends some, but to those who would receive it is a joy and a delight to finally, after days, weeks, years of the accusing word in their ears and on their conscience to finally hear, in the name of Jesus, I forgive you all your sins. Of course, the people that end up being forgiven are often the people that are the most offensive to others, who have their share of, what shall we call them, issues. 
Maybe ones who don't seem to quite fit in, they don't look like us, they don't sound like us, they don't dress like us, perhaps. And yet they come desperately looking for someone finally to say to them, I forgive you your sins. And then they hear that word, and that word restores them. And now joins them to us in that word of forgiveness, in Jesus, which then makes everyone who has been joined to them an offense, right? Makes the whole congregation of offense. How could that person be forgiven? How could that person be a Christian? And that's only the beginning. As we mentioned in the sermon on Sunday, so again, you hear from our epistle today in Romans 12, that as we bear that cross, that is to suffer the sins of others and forgive them in the name of Jesus, that it changes the whole way that we relate to one another, that we don't see one another as people who need to get their life together and get their act together and do all the right things so that they can save themselves from what is surely impending doom. But instead, that we would commend them to Jesus to be forgiven. And where there is forgiveness, there Jesus also promises to work by his Spirit with life and hope and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control, chastity, and the like. But not only for them, but for us too. You heard the long list that seemed almost impossible for you to fulfill, but is Paul's description of the cruciform life, the life under the cross, abhorring what is evil, clinging to what is good, being affectionate to one another, loving one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, rejoicing in hope, patient in every tribulation, praying for one another, distributing to the needs of the saints, showing hospitality, blessing those who persecute you, loving even your enemies, blessing them and not cursing them, weeping with those who weep, rejoicing with those who rejoice, being of the same mind, that is the mind of Christ, not repaying evil for evil, but forgiving day after day, leaving vengeance to the Lord, who alone can exercise such vengeance. That's not easy to do, and it will make you an offense to others so much so that maybe they will want to crucify you like they crucified Jesus. But if that's what comes, so be it. That's the Lord's will. Instead, never cease to show forgiveness to others, suffering others' sins, just as Jesus suffered yours, but ultimately forgave them. May God grant us faith to forgive. In Jesus' name, amen. We stand for the offertory.